Hi, I'm Questlove. Normally I'm in New York, and normally that's plenty of a city for me, with its rich cultural and artistic diversity. But Miami during Art Basel is one of the few spots in the world that out New York's New York. During this festival, there's an amazing cross-pollination between music, art, and culture. It's an epicenter of organic creativity that brings out some of the best art from Latin America, Europe, and the United States. That's why I decided to hold one of my food salons here. I invited the country's best chefs to cook for me in the select group of luminaries in the field of art, design, music, comedy, fashion, architecture, and literature. Tonight's chefs, Daniel Patterson, Dave Baran, and Christina Tosi, are all creatives I admire greatly for their ability to think about food in new ways. In New York, I hold salons in the Frank Gehry building where I live. Here, I'm borrowing a 1930s house in Miami Beach that belongs to Tom Healy, an award-winning poet and chairman of the Fulbright Scholars Program. Thanks, Tom. Let's get ready for the salon. The first restaurant I remember going to was an Italian spot called Pagano's. Later that restaurant shut down in the 80s and reopened as a kind of college nightclub which would later host the very first Roots nightclub show. When I tell people my five favorite cities of all time, a lot of them are shocked, but I choose those cities based on its relationships to cinemas, movies, things that I love, uh, used record stores, strip clubs, and uh, food spots. I love coming to Miami just to try the different types of uh, Cuban restaurants. Like I often look for really underground spots or kind of hole in the wall spots that no one knows about. Food can travel. You can put anything in a box and send it somewhere, but it loses its context, its meaning, and its, its connection to the emotional content that it carries when it's situated within a culture and a place. The dish I chose for tonight, which now that I am in Miami where it is quite warm and tropical, I realize is wildly out of place. I wanted to do something that was pretty easy. From what it seemed about the dinner party aspect, that there was a lot of social kind of element to it. And I wanted to do something pretty interesting that maybe someone hadn't seen before. So it's, um, it's a dish that's very kind of of the moment in California, so matsutake, which has a short season and we're kind of right at the peak of the season. Shave raw over the top of porridge of spelt, which is flavored with miso, oyster, white soy, and a little bit of grilled matsutake. So savory, kind of earth, ocean, nutty, very interesting, delicious flavors, all kind of smoothed out with some butter. I think it's probably something that people haven't seen before, so I thought that would be part of what the salon was about. You know, the identity of the restaurant is always changing and it's often identified not just by the food or the service style but by the total package and so really we start with the menu structure we start with a name a word and from there it builds out and you start to say well what is the feeling what is the emotion behind it how do you want to stretch from there you know what is the story to be told how many chapters are in the story during the time when I, I did the pilgrimage to Jiro I realized that he too was telling the narrative the same way that I tell narrative when I'm DJ the first three pieces were sort of flat tasting, and then the next three pieces of sushi he served was like, it was real salty, and then the next three was real, real buttery, and then uh, the next three were like protein full, and then the last final three were like the sweetest tasting sushi you ever had. And I realized like, oh, he's telling the story. And even though we weren't communicating verbally, by the time I got to the seventh or eighth piece, then I realized like, oh, you're just taking me on a, a, a taste journey. And I do the same thing with my DJ sets. I start off slow, I build to a fever pitch. Some of the best songs I play are the songs that are bad songs. You know, I gotta let people down just so that next song is higher. So there's a rhythm to it. I really draw a strong association with music. That can kind of sound cliche, but you know, often when we talk about menu composition, we refer to albums because as you look at a menu and how it's structured, you know, you can either have a menu of greatest hits or you can have a menu that tells a story. And with Next, the intent is to always have a story. I'll often refer to a Radiohead album because 
you know, any one of their songs is, is good and it can stand alone, but often when you listen to an album, a great song is greater because of what precedes it and what follows it. So the dish I'm doing tonight, we've been doing a lot of research as far as classic French, Paris bistros, because uh, that's our upcoming menu. And so I've just, I love duck and I've been ordering a lot of duck in and playing with it. And so I thought it'd be fun to test drive something here. I've never done the dish, it might suck, I don't know, but we're gonna see what happens. So I grew up as an infamously picky eater. When I started getting into food, I decided to just stop being a picky eater. There was one day where food, all food, savory and sweet, excited me. And my philosophy is that I try everything. At the restaurant, all the cooks kind of make fun of me because there's a lot of foods I just don't like. Foods that I hate include red bell peppers and beets. I hate beets, which seems crazy because sugar, you could argue, largely comes from beets. But I was scarred by them at a very early age, and I can't taste anything but just like the earthy terror of being force-fed them as a child. I hate celery. I don't know why, but I hate it. I hate bell peppers. They're just like the worst. The green ones, yellow, red, it doesn't matter. However, that being said, I find there's a very important spot in certain foods for it. There's plenty of times where, you know, we just did a monkfish dish recently that had celery as a focal point. So I don't necessarily think I've encountered something that I, I won't use or can't use as much as just things in my personal life that I choose not to indulge in. The greatest sign of a great chef would be to make a dish with bell peppers or beets and make it delicious and appetizing to someone that believes that they strongly <laughs> disapprove of the flavor. My cooks like to test me. They like to see, see what I'll pick up every now and then. Food is really important. It's what I've spent my whole life doing, but it's not actually the most important thing in, in the dining experience. It's, it's the way that we understand the world around us, but it's also the way that we share an experience with other human beings. So it's the way we feed our families, it's the way we connect to our friends. And so when I was growing up, I think that was like the most important thing that I learned and assimilated is that it's the entire experience of what it means to, to share a meal with someone and to feed someone. At Alinea, we always talked about innovation and, and what that meant. And we always had this sort of running monologue about how you only get one hot potato a year, you only get one oysters and pearls a year, you only get that one glorious aha moment where you come up with, with that, that thing, that nugget. And it's amazing when it happens and you want to show it off to everyone. But on the flip side, that can kind of put a halt to your progress because you say, well, we have this and we don't want to stop doing it. And next, you know, the, the curse is that you can't have that, but that's also the gift. That becomes very much a driving point. You have to be able to let go of what you've done to step forward. I'm working with Roy Choi on a fast food chain, which the basic premise is, how do you bring real food at fast food prices, which this is where most of our country eats. You know, if you think about all of the forms of public eating fast food, restaurants are the only place where everyone feels like they belong. And you say, we're gonna keep that because that's important. But then we're gonna treat these people that come in with love and we're gonna cook good food and we're gonna keep the price exactly the same. We have some good music, we have a nice environment, make people feel like even in neighborhoods where maybe there isn't that kind of thing now, but maybe we're coming in saying, hey, look, we care about everyone who walks in the door. Maybe that then can have some kind of domino effect that spreads out more than just a freestanding restaurant can do because freestanding restaurants really, we just deal with a very finite amount of people a night. We can only reach so many people. Tonight, um, I brought a caramel apple pie with a pretzel crust, uh, cranberry, gingerbread, cake truffles, and a shot of pretzel milk. So salty, sweet, not too sweet. The flavors that I create, are they're all very loud. They're all very strong. They're all very punchy. And I think that's an important part of dessert. You don't have to eat a lot of it. Dessert doesn't have to be all sweet. It's about balance and about making something poignant. And for me, a lot of that translates into depth of flavor and the punchy flavors that you bring. I look at dessert, at least for me, it's because it's what I love to do, as the opportunity to erase your memory from any of the savory food that you had before and have it be the thing that you can't stop eating or that, you know, the plate's clean even though you didn't intend it to be. And that's the thing that you take out with you from 
a memory standpoint and something that excites you and that you want to talk about day after day. So I think also succeeding on any level in the culinary industry is having to approach your course and what you create with a competitive sense, saying, I want my dish to be the one that people remember. And if I want people to remember my dish, it better be something that already reminds them of something, because that's the easiest way to strike that chord and that connection with people. On the foundation of Next, no matter how much we change, how different it gets, there's always this grounded point where we're really trying to craft a personal experience and we're really trying to take a guest to a place that A, either they've never been and they're very interested in going to, or B, a place that they've already been and they've missed. And as long as you at any time sit down and pick up a course and take a bite at any course, whether it's a 25 course menu or a four course menu, and you take that one bite and you have that, that glorious moment where it takes you somewhere, then we've accomplished our goal. And I think that's the one continuing point and next that we've tried to drive home in every menu. Cooking for another person is one of the most human things we can do. If I take all this time and effort and, and, and emotion and I put it into the food and I give it to you, that experience is so primal. We eat with our eyes first. And when we see something that's scary, it's not a familiar shape, it's not a familiar color, it polarizes, I think, all of our other <laughs> sensory organisms before we go to eat. Creating a dessert that has a flavor that's out of the box or surprising, but putting it back into a familiar vehicle, I think is very important. I think that at least is the secret to my success and something that I tapped into when I first started Milk Bar that was somewhat missing in the dessert scene. I think a lot of us have control freak issues. I kind of like the psychological control that, you know, something that I'm doing is, is going to last with you for the rest of your life and that you're enjoying it. And I imagine that with chefs, it's the same thing. I've been to some places around the world where they literally have no critics. And some of the chefs have told me, you know, we'd actually like someone to come in and tell us what they think. Before we ever release a menu to the public, we will serve it to our staff multiple times and we'll take turns and from there we do a broad spectrum of people. You know, I often focus on a handful of chefs that I trust to immediately say this sucks. You know, because who can you trust more than the person who wants you to know why it sucks? And then, you know, you, you pull from an audience that says, you know, they're the general diners who are actually going to buy a ticket. Every chef needs to listen. No one has all the answers. So every customer that walks into our door, they perform the function of a critic. If they're happy, that's good. If they're not happy, well, something needs to change and maybe they ended up in the wrong restaurant, but it could be we're not doing our job well enough. So I think the function of criticism is how much do you care and how much do you want to get better? I think the most exciting part of the future of food is how we are going to substitute ingredients like eggs and flour as farming practices and water supplies sort of wane and wean and we started to use a product that is an egg replacer that comes from proteins that are isolated from a certain strain of yellow split peas and my biggest excitement is cricket flour literally flour made from crickets ground down pulverized into a flour like consistency if i had a wish list the one single thing is to get people eating real food you think about how we feed people in hospitals, prisons, schools, unbelievable. Most of our country is being fed by corporations, it's crazy. So you know, as a chef, you take a step back and you look at it and you're like, holy shit, actually chefs aren't feeding this country. Why not? Why can't we? There's a false idea that you can make people come to you. You can have the best idea and say, well, what you're, what you're eating is not good, so you're gonna naturally, get... no, it doesn't work like that. We need to go to people, we need to find them where they are, understand how they live, and say, here's something that can actually work into your life. Here's something that you can afford. As a young cook, I was very bound up in the idea that I really wanted to be successful, and you know, cooks are fucked up, so your sense of self-esteem and your, your sense of success all kind of get bound up together and it's hard to extricate, but as I've gotten older, this idea of how do we feed people better how do we take care of them? How do we make them feel like they matter is the most important thing to me. You know, I'm, I'm at a third phase of my life right now in which I'm really not quick to rush to pander or cater to a particular audience. Uh, I will prepare a meal or a DJ set uh, ahead of time 
and I will stick to my guns. And I'm often depressed when I'm otherwise forced to sort of give in and play to the crowd, uh, which I don't think makes you selfish. I think it just makes you a visionary. And there's a certain vision that you want your people to see. And if they're just patient enough to ride with you, then I believe a good time will be had by all. Thank <laughs> you.